So we are going to be looking at the, uh, just before I open in prayer, we're going to be looking, of course, you can see the culmination of the book of Daniel is the legacy of the wise men, what we call wise men, the, the Greek word in the book of Matthew calls it wise men, the uh, Hebrew, and in, the, uh, in Babylon, they were called magi. But um, these last few chapters of Daniel, and of course, there's so much in chapter 7 to 12, we're not going to try to cover every part of this. We're just going to cover a few key points that will show us that really Daniel, uh, his goal had been all along the restoration of Israel. But God had to change his heart and mind to recognize that everything that he saw that was coming in the future was for the advance of the kingdom, which is far bigger than Israel, far bigger than the people he was involved with. And um, that was a, a challenge for Daniel to see the expanse. And yet um, that's exactly what God did. And of course, that legacy we want to look at. And just to highlight a few examples from chapter 7 to 12 that would be um, very helpful for us to, to see. So we're looking at the fact that the kingdom is the goal. And that's kind of what we're looking at this. We are quickly, again, the liberty and captivity model. They are uh, the people of God have lived under captivity, meaning they had no freedom or rights, far more than they've ever been under liberty. Liberty is very rare, and it requires responsibility to maintain that self-government and that liberty. And um, many times when um, the church or God's people, whether it's Old Testament or church, New Testament, are getting corrupt, God will allow captivity or at least a measure of captivity um, in order to purify his people. And um, as we've said here, less than 5% throughout history have ever enjoyed liberty like we have. But that the key point is that the same principles required to produce liberty are required to maintain it. And whenever there is difficulty in, in the, for the people of God, the God's goal is that we begin to expand and advance the kingdom, that there could be liberty and potentially in our own lifetimes, but especially for future generations. So just a quick point, we've obviously discussed this in greater detail. When we, when we in the past few lessons, lessons one to three, we've had three main lessons that everything God does in judging is redemptive. It has a positive purpose. Judgment of God is not ultimately negative. It's ultimately positive. The Bible tells us that, that all chastening, all difficulties, all trials, all tribulations, um, wrenching, heart-wrenching situations of our emotions and our spirit drive us to God. They, they, they put us in a place of complete dependence. If we thought we could figure it out on our own, God will give us situations. We just can't figure it out. We just have to say, God, I just have to depend on you. I do not understand why this is happening. I think you can relate to those things how the way they are. Um, God certainly hasn't done everything I think he should have done. I know that I'm saying that facetiously, but the point is, it drives you to complete dependence on God. Think of this, that um, Daniel, from age 14 to about 86, we think Daniel died possibly about 86 years of age. Uh, there's no, no way to ascertain it completely, but he served seven monarchs. Think of it, Nebuchadnezzar, Evil Meriduk, Nereglisser. Labra Sardo and uh, Nabonidus, Belshazzar, Darius of Persia, all of these individuals he served without ever violating his faith. And these people were dictators. These people were not all good people. They were in a very pagan kingdom. That enough is a feat. Uh, he outlived and outserved all of these individuals. He understood God's word and he understood the culture he lived in. He and his friends worked in humility, as we've said before for decades sometimes without any outward manifestation of his power. And Daniel's influence, as we will see tonight, his influence was greater than any power he held. And Daniel's character and integrity was his legacy. And I want you to, I want you to know this, is, uh, this lesson tonight is going to go farther than just the uh, years of um, prophecy that Daniel saw in the coming kingdoms. It's, uh, it goes far beyond his lifetime. Those lessons are lessons that God can teach us over and over again. And um, uh, they're very important. Uh, biblical, the biblical attitudes that were held by Daniel and his friends, and I've rephrased some of these 
just to remind us again that um, God sends his people into captivity. We, we're on a mission. It's not just all, again, negative. We are, we are on a mission to be lights in the world. And uh, sometimes greater darkness means the light shines brighter. Um, if we could embrace the fact that the primary problem is not the evil around us, but the proud heart or evil within us. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in us than he is that is in the world. The greater power is within. And God's people are called to influence their culture, never isolate or assimilate, meaning just become like it. And we, though we cannot participate in evil acts, and we have to draw a line and say no, no further, we're to shine as lights in the world. And um, we don't, though we don't need freedom to be faithful, generations of faithfulness will produce liberty. And this is where we are praying right now. We continue to pray that God is God who is faithful to his covenant and whatnot is going to have a massive intervention in the near future. That's what we're praying for. Now, this is, again, a timeline that will be very difficult to see if you're watching a screen or if you're not close to it. I, that's why these PowerPoints, I'll, I'll, I'll make them available so you can look at it. We're now on the very end of Daniel's life. Uh, everything we talk about tonight, Daniel is in his 80s. In fact, probably 84 to 86 years of age, maybe 83 to 86. Uh, the very time when Cyrus makes the decree that the Jews can return to Jerusalem. And some of the chapters, uh, just very quickly, chapters 7 to 12, some of those chapters were written before some of the incidents that, that occurred in Daniel 5 and 6. Uh, you'll see at the beginning of the chapter 7 to 12, it says, all right, in the, the third year of Belshazzar's reign. Well, that puts it back to where chapter 5 is. Or in the first or second or third year of Darius's reign, that puts it in chapter 6. So the visions that are recorded in Daniel 7 to 12 that Daniel had uh, are visions toward the end of his life in his 80s, but they are uh, interspersed historically so that um, you, can, you can see that some of these took place at earlier time periods, and then Daniel wrote them down. And, um, and there's, a, there's a reason for that. This is why he's called a prophet by Jesus. Jesus calls Daniel a prophet because of these final chapters and uh, interpreting the visions and the dreams. And as we look at this, let's look at Daniel 7 for just a moment to give it give an idea. You see, I'm going to put this into three themes about the kingdom to make it as simple as possible. The first one we want to look at is Daniel reiterates in Daniel 7 the nature of God's kingdom. And it really is a more detailed description of his vision that he interpreted in Daniel chapter 2 with Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact, with Nebuchadnezzar, he had said that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Then there would become another kingdom, the chest of silver, another kingdom following that, the belly of brass, and the legs of iron and the toes of clay. The, and these we know today, by hindsight, is Babylon, Persia, Greek, and then the Roman Empire. But in Daniel 7, Daniel goes even in greater detail with this. Uh, he goes into greater detail because he now describes these. Now, remember, he hasn't seen these. Uh, he's living at the Babylonian time period when this takes place. And you find that, uh, and particularly um, when Babylon is talked about as a lion with eagle's wings, meaning here's this massive creature, Babylon, that swiftly conquers its foes and rules the whole world. And then that chest of silver, that's Cyrus the Great, that's Persia, that bear that comes to devour and destroys these kingdoms. See, every one of these kingdoms think they are the center of the earth. They think that uh, their captivity of, of God's people and others is going to last forever. One of the truths about the kingdom of God is no kingdom of man will last forever. It will come down. You know, in the 20th century, and a lot of us live through this, um, when you look at the 70 years of captivity under communist Russia and all the people that suffered there and who prayed in generations, that Berlin Wall came down. That, that um, structure did crumble, just like in the Old Testament time period. It's temporary. 
But also the nature of God's kingdom is completely different than these kingdoms. Uh, you see the third one, the Greek, it's, uh, we'll get into this in a little more detail, a leopard with four wings, because this means, as Daniel describes, Alexander the Great, conquering so quickly. And then, of course, the strong empire with huge teeth, ten horns, uh, all of these describing these four kingdoms, which you've already covered in Daniel 2. But here's the, the key point. Every kingdom of man is centered in power and control. God's kingdom is decentralized. And its focus starts with the individual. So we could look at this and say, you know, in Daniel 7, um, Daniel refers to God as the ancient of days. But you know, the phrase ancient of days is actually a phrase for the pre-existent Christ, before his incarnation, before his um, uh, coming to earth at, at Christmas. The ancient of days is referred to in Daniel 7. That the whole culmination, the whole point of Daniel's visions was to center on the coming of Christ. That Christ would be the fulfillment. That Christ would do what no one else does. Christ starts at the bottom. He destroys the pagan kingdoms because they always start at the top. It's always top down. You always think of how you can control from the top. And yet the symbol of Christ being born of a virgin, a stone cut out without hands, uh, without human agency, the virgin birth of Christ is so powerful. And this is the picture that we get. And in Daniel 7, 27, it says, And the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Now think about this. This makes God distinct and different, Jesus Christ, from every kingdom on earth. You see, when you think of a kingdom and a palace, you think of the king who owns all the wealth, he owns all the land, he owns everything. And you, if you possibly could have an audience with the king for five minutes, you do well. If your relatives know the king, if somebody knows it. But realize the kingdom of God, in God's way, is given to the people, to the individuals. Jesus reigns from within the hearts of individuals. He changes individuals. He changes uh, people's hearts. It's from the bottom up. It's not from the top down. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All dominions shall serve and obey him. Though Christ is the king of that kingdom, it's the only kingdom where the king lives in his subjects. This is the picture that Daniel gets. The kingdom of God is built distinctly different from the bottom up, and it will surpass all other kingdoms and fill the whole earth. The kingdom of God is progressing as we speak. We may not see it. We don't have the vantage point to see it in America right now, we don't see it. We see darkness. We see all kinds of things. And that, that's true. But the kingdom of God itself, because it works in the heart. Little do we know. Who knows who God is going to change from the inside out that's going to surprise everyone? Uh, can you think about it? Think about what we've been talking about in Daniel. Uh, who would have ever thought Nebuchadnezzar could change? Who would have ever thought that Nebuchadnezzar would get humbled and declare the God of Daniel to be the God of the whole earth? If God can do that with Nebuchadnezzar, some of the individuals that we think are the most evil right now around the world, God could change. God could change the heart like the rivers of water get changed. And God does that in individuals. That's our hope. That's the, that's the key. And to recognize this is what God is going to do. God is going to bring reformation at the bottom in our local hearts, our families. We say, what can we do? What can we do when we see what's happening all around us? We go to God and we say, God, work in my heart. Help me to trust you when I just don't see how whatever I'm facing is going to work out. You know, when you look at um, the power of God's kingdom, and as we move into Daniel 8, and we're looking at this, uh, Alexander the Great is, is described. Now, this is amazing. Now, I want you to think of this. In all the ancient kingdoms, actually throughout all the world, nobody has ever heard of any single individual producing a 3,000-mile-long empire in only 13 years. It's just, it's incredible. When I taught this to high school students, I put this map up digitally in front of them. They have the map in their notebooks. And we'd look at this and you'd see the immense area that was controlled by Alexander the Great in only 13 years. 
And when he was done, so to speak, in 323 BC, he's only in his 30s. And it has been so suddenly, and this is what Daniel 8.5 does in describing Alexander the Great. Now, Daniel's never seen Alexander the Great. Uh, he has no idea what the Greek empire would be. But it said, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, meaning it came so fast that it conquered this area. But in spite of that, in spite of how great Alexander seemed to be, the power of God's kingdom is greater. Now, I want to give you an illustration. A lot of people don't realize this, and I would, I, I would read this to the students. I'm going to read it to you. In history, if you look at this map, if you look closely at the map, you will see that the red line of his conquest goes right through Israel, right through the Holy Land. And yet, there's no battle marked at that place. And not only that, um, Israel was spared. Jerusalem was spared. If Alexander the Great is this strong and mighty, people don't even want to fight him. They just, they just kind of um, give up. And um, I'll put a circle around that very spot, uh, maybe in the next, in, when the PowerPoint gets uh, produced here, but, uh, or, or reprinted. One of the things is, I want to read you uh, this area of what happened to Alexander the Great when he approached Israel. And how did the priests of Israel, this is in the 300s now, B.C., how did they prepare? This is after Malachi. This is, the, the Old Testament has closed, but the Jewish people are still following God. There's a remnant still following God out of Jerusalem and out of the Holy Land and that holy area. And I want you to just to, to see this. I'm going to read to you now, and this uh, I'm reading to you from Matthew Henry's commentary and also uh, who alludes to Josephus, the Jewish historian. So Josephus relates that when Alexander had taken Tyre and subdued Palestine and was upon his march to Jerusalem, Jadus, who was then high priest, Nehemiah mentions one of, one of his by name in chapter 12, 11, fearing his rage, had recourse to God by prayer and sacrifice for the common safety, and was by him warned in a dream that upon Alexander's approach, he should throw open the gates of the city, that he and the rest of the priests should go forth to meet him in their habits and all the people in white. Alexander, seeing this company at a distance, went himself alone to the high priest, and having prostrated himself, before that God, whose name was engraven on the golden plate of his mitre, he first saluted him. And being asked by one of his own captains, what are you doing? He said that while he was yet in Macedon, musing on the conquest of Asia, there appeared to him a man like unto this, thus attired, who invited him into Asia and assured him of success in the conquest of it. The priests led him, Alexander the Great now, into the temple, where he offered sacrifice to the God of Israel, as they directed him. And, and there they showed him the book of the prophet Daniel. Now, now, this reads like Cyrus, remember? He all of a sudden, he's now dead. They show him dead. Daniel's dead. He's gone. But his book is shown to Alexander the Great. That They were saying, listen, Alexander, you're in the book. God foretold that you would do this, and it was there foretold that a Grecian would come and destroy the Persians, which animated him very much in the expedition he was now meditating against Darius. So he's going after Darius, and um, hereupon he took the Jews and their religion under his protection. He promised to be kind to those of their religion in Babylon and in Media, whither he was now marching, and in honor of him, all the priests who had sons born that year called them all Alexander. Now think of this. This is an amazing event. They call this a massive providential event for obvious reasons. Because here, here's Alexander the Great, and because out of prayer, out of influence, 
they don't know. They just say, God tells them, all go out dressed in white. Happens to be the exact attire of a dream that Alexander had uh, in Asia, and therefore he protects the Israelites. Do you realize how providential this is? If the Israelites had been wiped out in both Babylon and Jerusalem, there is no lineage for Jesus. There is no, there is no uh, protection. So actually, the book of Daniel protects the Jews. It's kind of like a story of Esther. It's, uh, it's amazing because the power of God's kingdom is greater than the power of man's. It influences the heart of an Alexander. And um, it's, it's truly amazing. But that's not all. There's another prophecy that comes out of Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 about a very wicked king, a, a Greek king who would rule Israel and persecute Israel and actually want to destroy Israel. And his name is Antiochus, and Antiochus IV. But I want you to, I'm going to read it right from Daniel right now, because I'll tell you the power of God's kingdom is on both ends of this, softening Alexander's heart and allowing Antiochus a limited victory. Remember that word limited. God never allows evil to be unlimited. We might think darkness is really great right now in our lifetime, even in our nation right now. But it would be a whole lot worse if God allowed it to be unlimited. It is limited. So Daniel 8, 9 through 11 and 13 and 14 describe it this way. And out of one of them, the Greek powers, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land, which is Israel. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now notice, Daniel's getting this specific. That's six years, three months, 18 days, that this is going to happen, and you're going to have this until the sanctuary is cleansed. Now, this is amazing. This is giving us the idea that there's going to be a very evil ruler that's going to force the sacrifices to cease in Israel. He's going to be a terrible evil and persecution. And here's here's the Holy One, the angel. How long is this going to take long? How can you let evil, this amount of evil reign? And it's limited to the exact day. Now, that prophecy... In Daniel 8, 14, about the exact duration was fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in the most amazing way. Now, by the way, I'm retelling just a small portion of the story of Hanukkah. The story of the festival of dedication and lights. It's an amazing thing because the Bible then tells us that there will be individuals who will do exploits. Now, you can't get any better than this. Um... Mattathias is the chief of his family, the Maccabees. He's 145 years of age when he says this. He's 145. He says, alas, why was I born to see this, the ruin of my people, the ruin of the holy city, and to dwell there when it was given over to the enemy? And someone said, well, why don't you just defect to the enemy? He said, even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king depart, each one from the religion of his fathers, yet I and my sons, he had five of them, and my brothers will live by the covenant of our fathers. We will not obey the king's words by turning aside. So he was saying, listen, even if we get killed, we are not going to obey Antiochus. We're going to stay faithful to the God of our fathers. See, there's always a remnant with God. And actually, the Bible tells us in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, that the one that would oppose Antiochus, would do exploits. The people who know their God shall do exploits. At 146, a year later, he's on his deathbed. Uh, There's an ancient little drawing that I put on there about this. He's got his son surrounding him. He ends up putting Judas, his son, in charge. And Judas says these words, uh, or uh, Mattathias says, arrogance and reproach have now become strong. It is a time of ruin and furious anger. Now, my children, show zeal for the law. Give your lives for the covenant of your fathers. Remember the deeds of the fathers, 
which they did in their generations and received great honor and an everlasting name. So here he inspires his sons to do the unthinkable. Now, against all odds, folks, Judas, who was put in charge, had 5,000 men. And he was going against an army of 60,000. And he won. Why? How could you win with those odds? He said this, Judas did, it is easy for many to be hemmed in by few, for in the sight of heaven there is no difference saving by many or by few. It is not on the size of the army that victory in battle depends, but strength comes from heaven. Now you might say, this is ancient history. Where are you getting all this? Well, you know, the story of the amazing works of God are in what we call the Apocrypha, the middle section of the Bible. Now it's not inspired. We don't treat it on par with scripture, but it is history. And it is fairly accurate history. And so he's saying, look, it, God decides whether we win by few or by many. Folks, I think we need that message today. <laughs> the remnant of God and in prayer, it can happen. Daniel eleven thirty two 32 says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. That's Antiochus. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. That's talking about the Maccabees. It's talking about the amazing power of God's kingdom. When you are faithful, let's put it this way, no matter how outnumbered we are, faithfulness to God is more powerful than the biggest army in the world. Because God fights for us. That's imperative. And that, of course, produces Hanukkah, where they go in and they cleanse the temple, the temple on the very day. In fact, it's the exact day that it had been completely desecrated three years before, and all the way back to that prophecy of the six years or, or so that Antiochus was in their ruling, and to that very day, the temple was cleansed, and when it was cleansed, they had enough oil for just one lamp, and yet all nine burned, and they, nine, they burned for eight days. And because of that, it's called the miracle of Hanukkah, the miracle of the Feast of Dedication, and I give you the reference in John 10, 22 to 39, because Jesus went to that feast. Of dedication. He honored Hanukkah because of what God did during that time. So the power of God is phenomenal. Now we get to a culmination. The kingdom is the goal. We see that in Matthew, so where do we make this connection? What does Daniel have to do? First of all, we've seen Daniel had a major impact on Alexander the Great, just as he had an impact on Cyrus the Great. Daniel also had an impact foretelling the fact that there would be a righteous remnant that would rise up against the most evil king. By the way, you know why he says he was lifted up to be in the most high? He gave himself the nickname Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes. Everybody else called him Antiochus, the angry one. But he said, no, I am like God. I am God. And he gave himself that nickname. And that just caused the people of God to rise up and say, even if we get martyred, or not obey. And now, what about if Daniel affects these future rulers, and he's not even alive? He's affecting them just by his own book. The book of Daniel, just want you to know, was the most widespread ancient manuscript of the Bible that everybody in ancient antiquity knew about. Everybody heard of Daniel. When Daniel died, he had such a high character and integrity People talked about him all the time. Now, let's talk about this. This is an amazing testimony. I won't do it justice. I don't have the time to do that. But I'll tell you this. You should be able to, like me, say, oh, God, this is amazing. If we live faithful lives unto you, you will take the legacy and you will, you will be amazing. So who were these wise men that came to Jesus? Where do they come from? Well, in Daniel 2.48, it says, then the king promoted Daniel gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief, meaning captain, administrator, governor, over all the wise men in the Hebrew uh, magi of Babylon. So Daniel was the captain of all the wise men. That meant he got to instruct them on the ways of God, beginning at 14, 15 years of age in Daniel 2. He likely held this position of leadership over the Magi again and again, his entire life, over 70 years. There are hints all through the book of Daniel 
that he is still holding that sway. Remember, even when the handwriting came on the wall and they called all the wise men, they all knew it. And the queen had to say, there's only one that couldn't do it. He's the captain. He's the chief. Go get him. He's in his 80s. And he comes out. And likely, you have to realize when the decree to return came, when Daniel was in his 80s, after the 70-year captivity, only about 2.5% of the Jews in Babylon returned to Jerusalem. Now, that's sad, a very small remnant. Many of the others had gotten too comfortable living in Babylon. But here was another positive point. There were godly Jews who remained in Babylon, just like Daniel and his friends had inspired them to do. And they lived godly lives without compromise, but had a major influence in Babylon. And the major influence they had was over the Magi. Because do you know that there were some of the Magi in future generations that were now court astronomers? They're not astrologers. They don't look to the sky to get their destiny or their fortune or anything else. These are individuals who look and say, there's something in the heavens. This is that they would know about Daniel's big prophecy, the 70 week prophecy. They knew the book of Daniel very, very well. They knew what Daniel had compiled and they were willing to say, we are going to look and to watch for the signs of when God is going to send the Messiah that Daniel prophesied in chapter nine. They were looking for him. And not only that, Daniel dated it. He gave them the general dates and even the specific dates for when Messiah would be cut off. Think about this, that in chapter 9 of Daniel, he prays interceding for his people. Now, he's doing this at the beginning of the reign of Darius, but he knew that 70 years was now over. The people could return, but he confessed, we have sinned. That's an ecclesia-type prayer. Even though he had not been the one that sinned, he said, we have sinned. We are the ones. We have to take responsibility. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Lord, have mercy on your people. He appealed to God's covenant promises, and God answered his prayer. In fact, the legacy is truly amazing. Daniel had a visitation from the angel Gabriel, and then in Daniel 9, 24 to 26 and 27, we have this amazing prophecy. I'll read it, then I'll just highlight it and tell you why this is so significant that it relates to the Magi who came and visited Jesus just after his birth. 70 weeks or 490 years is the interpretation because of the way the Hebrews dealt with that weak symbol are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. So in other words, he's saying, look, in 490 years, Daniel, there will be someone who will finish the transgression, make an end of the domination of sin, make reconciliation. Who is this? This is Jesus. Know therefore and understand, he said, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 483 years. The street shall be built again, the wall, even the troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now, I know this is amazing, but if we look at a timeline, we realize there are several decrees. There's the decree of Cyrus that you can return. Then there's the decree by Darius that he repeats Cyrus's decree. Then Artaxerxes has a decree both with Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible. Now, the actual decree to rebuild Jerusalem, not just return, was Artaxerxes in 444 BC. In fact, we know the date because when we translate the Jewish calendar to our modern calendar, it'd be March 5th, 444. 483 solar years, that's 360 days a year. The mathematics has all been done out. And it takes us literally to the date of Jesus' crucifixion on March 30, 33 AD. When Jesus died, he took that transgression, was nailed to the cross. That leaves seven 
extra years. That was fulfilled those seven years in the tribulation of 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. To the day, that was that, and the seven years were separate from the 483, just like his prophecy. Now, why is this even important? I don't want to get into all the details of the prophecy, though it certainly is truly, truly amazing. I mean, what are the odds that a, some guy in Babylon in his 80s is going to get a vision and name the years and, and name when, it's, when the clock starts? It's only God. And it shows you how powerful, how powerful God is. You know that those final seven years, which were different, it was, took 49 years to destroy, to restore Jerusalem, and it was destroyed in 70 AD. But you have this. Why is this important? Because this 70-week prophecy forms the grid by which all the Magi are instructed generation after generation following Daniel. Because they're instructed on several key things. One was this. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. This is Numbers 24, 17. These scriptures are the scriptures Daniel had. What does this mean? A star shall come out of Jacob. Well, first of all, the heavens were like a, a book that they would read uh, during those times. And by the way, Jacob was part of the tribe of Judah. Judah is the lineage from which Jesus comes. And the star, it could have been supernatural. But it could have been a conjunction, timed by God, to lead these wise men. At that time, wise men were not kings. They weren't astrologers. They were court astronomers who would travel in a caravan of 24. In other words, they would have servants, probably only about 12 magi, and visited Jesus at 18 months old. You have to realize that they did visit Jesus after he had left the manger and moved into a house about 18 months after his birth. The wise men do not come the moment after he's born, but they come about a year and a half later. But it's about six months before the decree from Herod to destroy everybody two years old and younger. So you have this timing of events, which is truly amazing. They would have known this prophecy in Numbers 24. They would have known that if they see a star that is going to signify to them that the Messiah is coming, these wise men are going to want to see the beginning. And they don't know right away um, whether he's coming as a child or an adult. Now think about what the wise men would have known at this time period. First of all, this was well known in ancient studies. Do you know that the most ancient astronomers are listed in every culture as Adam, Seth, and Enoch? Isn't that amazing? That Adam, Seth, and Enoch were the first astronomers in all the world. Um, and that the signs of the heavens are confirmations of what God is doing, declaring his glory. They were not the cause of our personality, about the sign you're born under, plus those signs have all changed. They rotate, and uh, astrology is not something not only worth even uh, paying any attention to. That's not what we're talking about. But the 12 constellations told a story of redemption, and the key was to focus on Virgo and Leo. Do you know, how many have heard of the ancient Sphinx in Egypt? Do you know the most ancient? That has the uh, body of a lion, but the head of a woman. Well, that's be showing you that, listen, the, the whole story of God begins with a virgin and ends with the return of Christ as a lion. And uh, this is amazing because you see, this is what they studied, folks. This is how they, the names of the stars. God says he gave names to all the stars. Now, this may sound a little kooky, but it's not. He gave names, and we still have some of them. And some of them are directly given and in the scriptures, they're, they're the, the exact same phrase is in the Hebrew Bible. And what would they be looking for? Uh, the circular book may begin with Virgo and with Leo, but Regulus is the brightest star in Leo, the constellation Leo, and it means treading underfoot. It was always known as the star of kings. Regulus in the heavens was the star of kings. And in, coupled with Jupiter, which was the sign of the kings. So imagine this, if a conjunction took place, and that's what we're talking about with the Christmas star now, but a conjunction means that two planets, or a star and a planet, seem to come very close. Of course, they're not physically close to each other, but it's our appearance of what they come that would get the attention of these astronomers. Because they, what do they do for a living? They look at the heavens. They watch anything new. They probably didn't do it right away. They know, hey, 70 weeks, got a long time to go, pass down the legacy to the next generation, to the next generation. Keep it alive. 
Virgo has its brightest star, meaning it means the branch. It's actually the same Hebrew word as Zechariah 3, 8. I will bring forth a branch, says the Lord. And what if that was coupled with the planet Venus, which meant motherhood? In other words, what if the very signs and the names of these, not astrology, but the original names, what if they were reading these? We don't know for sure, but it's possible. In fact, if the stars and planets came together in some way, they would easily have interpreted this as a Jewish king that was to be born of a virgin. And believe it or not, in astronomy, we can actually go back and see what the sky was like at that time. Now, we used to sing a song all the time in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, but night unto night shows knowledge. Isn't that interesting? that night unto night shows knowledge, the knowledge that these people had. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, the invisible things of him are clearly seen. Now we have the Bible now the, to help us understand. We don't have the heavens. that The heavens was a book for them. But for us, we don't need that. I'm not asking people to look to the heavens and try to find out what God is, is doing, but God could confirm it that way. And this is what happened. Computers tell us what the sky looked like at any time in history. Jupiter and Regulus, that's that star, both of these mean kings had a conjunction in the constellation Leo. That means they came very close together unusually in September of 3 BC. We know in early 2 BC, another conjunction of Jupiter and Leo occurred. In other words, in case you missed the first one, God said, here it is, here's the second one. That would have gotten their attention. In June of 2 BC, Jupiter's retrograde motion, sometimes a planet seems to move backwards in the sky, it's only because of the angle we see it from the Earth, made it appear to dance around Regulus for the third time. Now, it's one thing to have a conjunction. You know the one they're talking about now? Doesn't hurt a car again for another 800 years or 400 years. We're talking here within a year, three conjunctions of the same planet and star. Kind of like, hello, God is saying, you better get moving. Virgo was also clearly seen. Now you see, one of the sub-constellations of Virgo is, uh, it actually has a star name that means the desire of all nations shall come. That's a prophecy out of the book of Haggai. Amazing. In Rome, these signs were interpreted. You know, uh, this was not unusual. The Romans studied this uh, signs as well. And they said, oh, it's, it's actually 2 BC, it's the 750th anniversary of our founding is Rome, and it's Caesar Augustus's 25th year, and they named the Caesar the Prince of Peace, Pax Romanus. They named him the King of Kings. Isn't that way God does? Here's the world saying, all those signs of kingship, that's for us. And God's saying, no, right under your nose, I'm going to do what I've always done and bring my kingdom in a completely different way with a child, and therefore only those that had been studying the uh, uh, prophecies of Daniel, that had been studying that this was going to be a Jewish king, not a Roman king. This was, this was going to come from the Jewish legacy, not a Roman legacy. This was going to come because Messiah is the one that's going to come. And then all of a sudden, it's coupled with the constellation Virgo. It's coupled with the planet Venus. It's coupled with king, a king is going to be born as a baby from a virgin. Now, that would get some wise men moving. And they know where they're going. They don't have to watch a, a star like a flashlight. They know where they're going. The amazing lessons we can learn then, it can culminate with this. Now, I've told you the conjecture based on astronomical evidence. There are some videos that have been put out uh, on this kind of a thing. Uh, there are... There are, I'm not making this up. I've researched this, but I can tell you the following. And I, and I have at the end of this, uh, when the, this video gets recorded and put back up, there will be two attachments that are give, given to you. One is uh, my little article on Hanukkah. So you can see the context there. And it will also be uh, my address that I turned into a research paper on the star of Bethlehem that, um, that you can read too with a fully footnoted and all the rest. But here's the key thing though to recognize. So what do we learn from Daniel in all of this? God's judgment is redemptive. It's positive. Captivity is only temporary. Influence is greater than power. 
Your character is your legacy. Focus on the things that matter. And the kingdom is the goal. God times all events in the interests of his kingdom, filling the whole earth. Daniel had to recognize the kingdom was not just for Israel. It's going to go beyond Israel. It's going to fill the whole earth. He had to get a concept of the Gentiles long before his time. This was powerful. In fact, when you think about Daniel, I think about chapter 12. We call chapter 12 of Daniel the, the chapter of victory. But I liken this. It's a call for each one of us. That those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Folks, that's where the goal is. The goal is, Lord, make our life shine like a star. At the same time, folks, when I heard there was going to be a little conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, there's Jupiter again, and looking at this whole time period we're in right now, could it be? Maybe God's confirming he's going to do something. He's not going to do it because of the planets or the stars. We don't. There's no power in them. It's the word of God that is our focus. At the same time, there's amazing confirmation. Would you agree that God is so sovereign, he could time the astronomical rotations of planets that could have given attention to court astronomers that throughout the generations had been studying it since their captain Daniel had gone home to his Lord for 450 to 500 years. And then they see it. And yes, we've made them into three wise men only because there are three kinds of gifts that were given to Christ. There were many more, I'm sure, probably up to 24 in a caravan that came when he was a year and a half old. But the amazing part about it is God times it perfectly. And the world thinks it's for them. So I close with this. The world might think right now they're on the cusp of total victory. And when I mean that, I mean darkness, total victory to rule the whole world. But God has caused something else to happen. And there's a stirring in the hearts of his people and his kingdom worldwide. God has the final chapter, folks, not the enemy. God has the final say. He's timed all events in perfect timing. This is truly amazing. So I just highlight those things. You're going to see these attachments when they come, and uh, you'll be able to uh, take a look at them when that actually